Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is economic interdependence. Let's get to it. The main result I want to communicate to you in this lecture is that countries that trade with each other tend not to fight against each other. This is true regardless of whether you are looking at those smaller scale militarized interstate disputes or full scale wars. And it's also true if you control for other factors. So holding fixed everything else that seems relevant, it is true that if you look at a pair of countries that are trading with one another, your expectation is going to be that they are less likely to be fighting with one another. Not every single paper that has a statistical analysis of interstate relations, trade, and war concludes that, but the vast majority of them do. But as we've seen before, correlation does not imply causation. It could reasonably be that the causal relationship goes the other way around. That is, the expectation of peace results in more trade. For example, I might not want to sign a trade deal with your country if I am anticipating that within the next five years, we may very well be at war with one another. It's not worth all of the startup costs to invest in getting all of that trade together if it's all going to fall apart in the event of a conflict. Nevertheless, it's also very reasonable to think that trade has a causal effect on peace. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on here. How can we explain why trade relations might cause peace? Well, if we think back to the last couple of units, we can form a cohesive theoretical story. Let's start with the last unit. There, we learned that trade creates a surplus. If two states engage in trade with one another, then each can focus their efforts on producing what they are relatively better at making. By doing so, more goods will be produced overall than if each of those states had an economy of autarky. The surplus that is created can then be split between the two countries, and thereby making both of the countries better off, at least at the national level. Think about how that connects to what we learned two units ago, when we were focused on the causes of war. There, we saw that the range of mutually preferable settlements grows larger as the costs of war grow. How does that interact with trade? Well, states can't adequately trade with one another if they're at war with each other. I suppose it's possible on some level, but it's not really practical. For example, if your country was at war with Canada, you'd be hard pressed to convince a bunch of sailors from your country to get on a boat and take that boat into a Canadian port. It's very possible that a Canadian submarine might sink the boat in the process, or that once it arrives at the port, officials may wave it away, concerned about what you might be offloading. As a result, being at war means foregoing trade that trade surplus goes away. All that is saying, of course, is that the costs of war are going up, and specifically the opportunity costs for war increase as you have more trade that is going on between your two countries. If that verbal argument was hard to follow, it's easy to see what's happening visually. Think back to how we constructed bargaining ranges, and imagine that we're in a world without trade. Well, the size of the bargaining range is equal to the sum costs of war. If you take A's costs and you add it to B's costs, then you have the entire length of the bargaining range. Now let's add trade to the mix. Trade is just an opportunity cost for war, so it's like having another cost on top of the original cost. That means that we're shifting the minimum that A needs further to the left, by a value equal to A's share of the trade surplus, here denoted as TA, and we're shifting the minimum that B needs to be satisfied further to the right, here denoted by the trade surplus for B, which is TB. And if we compare the two, you'll see here that the bargaining range with trade is larger than the bargaining range without trade. 
So if you were a diplomat throwing a dart at the peace board, you would be more likely to hit a peaceful settlement with trade than without. And indeed, that's the basic idea behind most theories of economic interdependence and peace. Trade makes war less appealing, and the less appealing war is, the less likely bargaining breaks down. But I do have a caveat here. This is true for most explanations for war. If you were to advance beyond just an introductory class to international relations, you would start learning about exceptions to the rule. Here, the rule is larger bargaining surplus, more peace. The exceptions to the rule are that it's possible under some circumstances for the value of trade to go up, and as a consequence of that, the likelihood of war to go up here. But like I said, those are exceptions to the rule. They are not the rule. Okay, so that's the basic theoretical idea behind economic interdependence. Now let's talk about it in practice. Policymakers are well aware of the basic theoretical idea behind economic interdependence and have tried to use some of its recommendations to hopefully make the world a more peaceful place. Perhaps the best example of this is the saga that ran from World War I to World War II. You will recall that the peace treaty that ended World War I absolutely hammered Germany with war reparations. Those war reparations sagged Germany's economy, leading to runaway inflation and a large amount of underlying grievance within the country. That grievance then helped Adolf Hitler get elected into power, and once in power, Hitler reactivated the German war machine, turned the grievances on the other countries within Europe, and that helped spark World War II. Even as World War II was ongoing, the Allies realized the inherent problems in the World War I treaty and started taking steps to make sure that there wouldn't be a repeat to that after World War II. So in 1944, the United States hosted the Bretton Woods Conference at Mount Washington Hotel. This is actually a relatively well-known place in the United States. Mount Washington is a very tall mountain. You can actually see it in the background of this photo here. It's known for exceptionally high winds and the fact that you can actually drive your car all the way up to the top. So it's a huge tourist trap. But inside the hotel, and actually inside this very room, the Allies were negotiating what international institutions to create to try to reduce a repeat of that sort of grievance-based conflict. And actually, if you squint very closely at this photo, you can see me in the mirror. Two international organizations that trace back to those negotiations are the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These organizations do a lot of things, but pertinent to the conversation here, they act as a consulting resource for countries to create sound economic policies that will result in economic growth. Along those same lines, they will help invest in economic development projects that they think will have a good return and thereby allow smaller countries to grow their economies. And they also act as a lender of last resort. If an economy is about to go bankrupt and needs some sort of liquidity, the International Monetary Fund can provide that. So to tie all of this together, these organizations help improve those economies, allow them to trade and engage in international commerce, and reduce the overall level of grievances that might be necessary to start a war. And of course, we've seen the third major international political economy organization, the World Trade Organization, which is geared toward reducing trade barriers and trying to make sure that states do not engage in trade wars so that we have a surplus to be divided. Again, all of that ties into a larger opportunity cost for war, and thus, under most mechanisms, less war. Before wrapping up, it's worth briefly talking about a couple of other interdependence theories that operate aside from the opportunity cost argument. One of those is the exchange of information. Remember in our unit on crisis bargaining that one explanation for why bargaining may break down is due to uncertainty. This is the example that we've seen before with uncertainty over resolve. Here, A is unsure whether B is unresolved or more resolved. If B is unresolved, then it is willing to make substantial concessions to A to ensure the peace. On the other hand, if B is resolved, A can't demand as much in bargaining. 
If A is under the impression that B is very likely unresolved, then it is worth making expansive demands to try to get as good of a peaceful deal as possible, even though that runs the risk of having B reject if A's initial assumption was wrong and B is actually resolved. Under the exchange of information argument, trade between A and B allows information to flow across the border. Imagine for a moment that A started off thinking that B is very likely unresolved. Then that new information flowing across the border may allow A to update its belief and become convinced that B is actually resolved. If so, A's demand is going to be smaller and its concessions to B are going to be more generous. And that would help us avoid a war. However, the theory behind this is not as robust as the opportunity cost argument. It could very well be the case that A starts off thinking that B is resolved, in which case, in the absence of any new information, A would be inclined to make a safe offer that B is very likely to accept. Yet, through the exchange of information, A may start to get the wrong impression that B is unresolved. Information is noisy after all. Not everything that you learn from your spies is accurate. And if A starts to get the false impression that B is unresolved as a consequence of that flow of information, well, now A is going to make a more aggressive demand, which will cause B to reject. And the probability of war can go up as a result. The other alternative interdependence theory is a change to the underlying preferences of the states. In other words, by engaging in trade relations, I may start to form friendships with people in another country. And so as a result, I would be less inclined to support a war against that other country because my friend in that other country could be actively harmed. That's a plausible argument, and I'm sure it happens on a regular basis. Again, though, there's a bit of a robustness issue to that theoretical argument. It's also plausible that some individuals, after interacting with another country, may become more xenophobic. And if they become more xenophobic, then they may be more inclined to support a war against that other country. So it could go both ways. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.